Hey, this is Jake. Um, I'm just re-recording uh, the part of the section that was lost due to me not hitting the record session before. So um, fortunately, we lost out on some good, good question and answer, but uh, hopefully this will give you a good idea of what we covered. Uh, so this session is going to be on the reflective higher order row calculus. The last two sections were supposed to fo focused on pi calculus. Um, and last week, sort of, we completed the grammar and the equivalences and the reductions of pi calculus. So um, the row calculus stands for reflective higher order calculus. <clears throat> and I thought we should go over a bit what reflection and higher order means. So reflection is this ability of a computer program to examine, introspect, and modify its own structure and behavior at runtime. Uh, so this is the ability to take a running program, take its code, turn it into data, manipulate that data, and then turn that back into code itself, or at least that's how it's realized in the uh, row calculus. And then there's higher order programming. Uh, entities can operate on other entities at the same level. So in functional programming, this means that functions can take functions as arguments and return functions as results. So with the two things, two of these things together, you get sort of these nice <clears throat> software development properties where you can have uh, you know, computer scientists or, or program authors who are writing programs to write programs. Um, and this is, this is sort of important when you get to like industry scale <clears throat> level programming. Uh, so the motivation behind why we needed the uh, row calculus, uh, aside from sort of just adding these properties uh, to it, is uh, the row calculus gives us a more closed theory of computation than the pi calculus does. So the pi calculus, um, you know, we, we assume that we have this infinite set of atomic names uh, sort of just taken as an assumption when we're building our, our calculus, when we're building our processes, we use these names. Um, and this matters because any sort of infinite set, infinite set that we can think of uh, to actually implement the pi calculus is an atomic. Uh, there's some structure associated with it. So for example, you could take like the set of numbers, um, but even the set of numbers have some structure to them. Uh, you want to be able to say that two plus three equals three plus two, right? So the name eight should be the name eight. Uh, so when you have names that have these sort of internal structure to them, checking for name equality becomes a type of computation. Uh, and so our, all of a sudden with the pi calculus now, we have this fundamental theory of computation that we set out to create, um, but we're importing in implementation these names, which also contain in them um, some sort of computation or some sort of structural a structure inside of them. Uh, so if we can somehow map uh, the relationship between names and processes, uh, we would get a tighter theory of computation um, and we would have a guide for our, our implementation. So this is what the row calculus sets out to do. Um, just like in the pi calculus, we have processes which are represented as uppercase letters, usually like P or Q. Then we have names presented as lowercase letters. Uh, so the difference is that uh, names were sort of the base element of our pi calculus uh, on which processes were made, but um, in the row calculus, our processes are our base element, um, and names are constructed from processes. So let's get into the grammar to see how this is done. So constructing a process, we can have P or Q be zero or the null process. This is pretty much exactly the same as in the pi calculus. This just means that our process does nothing. It's a ground term is another name for it. Uh, we can also have um, this, this input process or, or prefix, prefix an input onto a process. And so this means pretty much the same thing it does in PyCalculus, where we take um, this name x and we're listening for some sort of input on name x. And then when we receive that input, we bind it to the name y. And then process p continues. But now anytime y is referenced in process p, um, anything, whatever was received here is um, what is substituted. In. So we can actually use whatever we receive on X in this process P. 
Um, and now is where we get a little bit different from the pi calculus. So we have this um, lift operator. So this uh, sort of maps similarly to the notion of the output um, prefix in the pi calculus. So we have this name x on which we're sending something. So that's um, in, in the pi calculus that I presented, this would have been the x over bar here. Um, and we're using these angle brackets instead. But um, still, we have this, this output on x. And then we have uh, this p process that we're sending on x. So that's a bit different in that in the, um, in the pi calculus, we, what we sent was another name. The other difference that we have here is that there is no um, dot q or dot p after this. So this is the asynchronous. Um, it's an asynchronous calculus, meaning that after we send something, we don't have this notion of do something after this is received on the other side. I'll say, um, Jake. Yeah. I, I think this is where I think it was Rinka's question is that how does the process p um, get translated to a name on the receive side up above for where y is. I uh, yeah, the, sure. I think that was the question. Yeah, so we have this, this process P being outputted here, output here, but we have this, um, it being received and called this name, it's a name over here on the input. So um, this actually gets defined in the reduction step, as we'll see later. Um, the, uh, yeah, essentially when when this input meets an output, when this input meets a lift, um, this process gets quoted and turned into a name and made available um, at, at the input. Um, so yeah, does that answer the question, you think? Yep, I think, it, I think it did. Plus, it is later on in, our, in the presentation there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, and then we have uh, the, the drop operator. So this is how we take a name and turn it, and the name X here, and turn it into a process. Um, so this is also can, can map to this notion of requesting to run the process um, that is underneath the name X. So um, if, if P here, uh, well, no, I don't think I'll go into that example right now. I don't have that prepared. Um, but, but essentially, if, if this process P gets um, outputted, um, gets received over here in this input, uh, and then say this process here was a request to run what was at Y, then this P would turn back into a process and would be run. Uh, so then there's this other notion of uh, running two processes in parallel. This is the same as what we saw in the pi calculus. Okay, so now we need to move on to define our equivalences because our grammar is a bit too fine grained for the notion of, uh, of what we want equivalent processes to be. We want P par Q to be the same as Q par P. So we need to define these things. So the first congruence that we define is structural congruence. This is the least congruence that satisfies the following properties. And the properties are um, that if we have um, a process in parallel with the zero process, that's equivalent to just the process P. And then if we have two processes running in parallel, um, it doesn't matter the order in which we name those, it should be the same. And then um, <clears throat> also our, our parentheses um, should, should be able to um, move here without changing the meaning of the process. And then the last thing that we need is alpha equivalence, which means renaming a free variable that's in our process shouldn't change the meaning of a process. So the um, example that I give here, did I miss? Um, oh yeah, I did miss something. Okay, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, okay, so constructing 
we went over the, the process constructions, um, and then there's the name construction, which is uh, we, we take a process and we do this quote operation, and that's what turns it into a name. Uh, so there are a few things in these name constructions and process constructions that we don't have in the row calculus that we had in the pi calculus. Um, and a few of them are the, the bang, the exclamation part mark, the replication operator. Um, it turns out that replication can be defined using uh, the constructions that we've given here um, because we now have this like reflective higher order code mobility notion. We can use that to implement the replication operator. Um, the other thing that we don't have is the, uh, the summation. We don't have um, taking two terms that have two different like atomic prefixes in front of them and saying that only one of these things will run. Um, and I, I think we should be able to implement that using these constructions as well. And then the other thing that's missing is we don't have the new operator. It turns out that the um, uh, using, using these process constructions, we don't actually need the new operator and we can construct that as well, which is pretty interesting. And the, the paper um, goes over how to actually implement those things uh, in, in detail. Um, the, the row calculus paper in 2005 written by um, Meredith and I think Mike stay as well. Uh, okay, so to define the free names and the bound names of, um, of the row calculus processes are, is, is pretty similar to what we have in the pi calculus. The free names of the zero process, there aren't any, um, there aren't any names in that process actually. And then the free names, uh, if we have, have this input here, our x is going to be a free name. And then y is something that we input and we bind. So y is not a free name. So we take, uh, yeah, we take x to be a free name. And then we find all the free names that are in p here. And then we remove y from that set of free names because, um, because y was bound. So that's, um, and if, if we take the free names in P without Y and X, that's all of our free names in this process. And then we have um, the lift operator free names. So here we have the, the code is gonna be made available or the output is gonna be on X. So X is a free name. Uh, and then we have any of the free names that are in P are also gonna be free names of this process. Um, if we have the, the process P par Q, we have the free names in P and the free names in Q are the free names of the process. Um, so note that if, if um, sort of X was bound in P, but it was free in Q, um, X would be a free name in P par Q. So um, having a free variable with the same name in a par as a bound variable um, means that that, um, that name is free in the, in the PARD process. Um, then we have uh, in this drop operator, um, when we're dropping the name X, X is a free name. And the bound names are any names that are referenced in a process that are not free. Uh, and I think that this is where I was informed that I wasn't recording and the next video that I should splice in should contain the rest of the discussion. So I'll stop the recording here. Stop to share.